privileged to have with us the Ombudsman of Ireland, uh, Emily O'Reilly, um, who is, um, in my estimation, the best Ombudsman we've had in this country. And she's going to chair the proceedings this morning. Just before we begin, um, Elaine from South Africa wanted to make an announcement about the African group that she's trying to convene at lunchtime. And, and let me uh, again reiterate that the African group um, we'll be meeting privately, but we have our purple shirted volunteers ready, willing, and able to bring your lunch over to you so that you don't lose out on the right to food and the duty to eat. So, Elaine, do you want to? Thank you. Thank you. This is just a reminder that we're convening a learn and share group um, for participants from the African countries and other developing countries to talk about some of the, the practical implications of Article 12 and Article 19 in the context of law reform especially. Um, it's a very informal discussion. Everybody is welcome to join. And as Gerard says, we will be able, you will be able to have your lunch during the discussion. So let's all meet at lunchtime outside at the coffee table um, and, then, and then we can move to the separate room. And just to say, if you are not from one of those countries, you are also very welcome to join us. Thank you. Okay, off I go. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank Jared for the invitation to chair this session. Um, he very cleverly got me in to do the one after the party the night before. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Jared. I actually didn't go. He had threatened uh, to um, play the accordion. Um, <laughs> And I, I, was, I was reminding him of the, of the joke about the, uh, well, I don't know whether it's a joke, I think it's very serious, um, the definition of, of a gentleman, somebody who knows how to play the bagpipes but doesn't. Um, so uh, Jared actually uh, told me that uh, you know, the accordion was a very different, uh, different more and more sensitive instrument than that, and uh, he would not have offended us. Anyway, Jared introduced me. I am the Ombudsman of Ireland. Um, there is only one in the public uh, sector, um, over the public sector as such. So him telling you that I am the best is really the compliment um, I was, uh, <laughs> Jared, I think, might have been hoping to give me. But thank you anyway. Uh, for those, I'll, ta I'll, I'll take it anyway. Um, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with, with what an Ombudsman is, uh, I'm a, an independent uh, official. Um, and I and my office take complaints in relation to maladministration uh, from uh, government departments, uh, the health service executive and a range of the non-commercial state bodies. I have a particular um, remit in relation to um, disability under our Disability Act and I take and deal with uh, complaints from people who have been, had difficulty accessing services or indeed uh, buildings um, in relation to public buildings and public uh, services. So I'm very active on, on that front and therefore I'm delighted uh, to uh, be here uh, this morning. When I asked Jared what the session was about, he very succinctly said, well, you know, we have all these conventions and treaties and this is about how to make it actually work in, in practice, uh, which I think is fantastic. One of my ombudsman colleagues has, has a, uh, an expression in relation to, to this uh, sort of issue. She says that we should live it, not laminate it. Uh, and I think we're going to be hearing uh, today um, how, how it should be lived. Our first uh, speaker is Eleanor Flynn. I think Eleanor may have already uh, spoken or intervened at this uh, particular uh, conference. She is the Senior Research uh, Fellow with responsibility for the research programme here at the Centre for Disability Law and Policy, National University of Ireland, Galway. And uh, she is certainly involved in, in the uh, sharp end of uh, of this particular issue. Uh, she's written a book based on her research for Cambridge University uh, Press entitled From Rhetoric to Action and I think the title of that speaks directly to um, uh, to our session here this, uh, this morning. She's also a member of the Academic Network of European Disability Experts uh, Working Group which is developing a monitoring tool for the European Union Disability Strategy 2010 to 2020. So you're very welcome, Eleanor. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm sure people are sick of seeing my face by now this week, but nevertheless, here I am again today. And some of you, if you've been to the summer school before, may have heard me or in other conferences present this before, so I apologise if you've heard the presentation before. And I would also like to say that this research and that this presentation is based on was completed almost three years ago now. 
and we looked at 11 different countries around the world and their national disability strategies and how they could be used to implement and monitor the convention. However, of course, if it's new, since it's nearly three years later, many things may have changed. I've tried to keep on top of the relevant countries that we examined, but I'm sure that there are much more changes that you, as people coming from some of those places, will know much more about than I do. And I would really welcome um, your feedback and your insights, and especially those of you from countries that I haven't covered in this presentation, who may have examples of good practice or indeed bad practice that you would like to share with us. We would definitely welcome that. So first of all, I'll just tell you a little bit about the scope of the research project and the methodology of how uh, this research was undertaken. And then I'll go straight into the research findings. I'll be focusing in this presentation on what we call the critical success factors. So there were eight criteria that I um, drew out of the research that I thought were important in making a national disability strategy work at a domestic level and making it have an impact on the lived experience of people with disabilities. Um, and then I'll say a little bit about what came out of that research and how we disseminated it and what the next steps are and again as I said I welcome your uh, interventions there also. So the scope of the research project, this was a comparative research project where I looked at national disability strategies as I said um, but I also looked at regional disability strategies so I looked at for example the European Union disability strategy, I looked at the Council of Europe disability action plan, the African decade of persons with disabilities, the Asia Pacific decade and the decade of the Americas. So again there's, there's quite a wide, wide range there. And in terms of the individual countries I focused on, uh, Ireland, because of that's where we were situated, was what I really wanted to draw the lessons from, and so that was a particular focus of the research. But I also looked at 10 other countries. And those countries were Australia, particularly looking at the state of Victoria, uh, Bolivia, Canada, particularly focusing on the um, province of British Columbia. I also looked at England and Wales, and I also looked at Portugal, the Philippines, Slovenia, Sweden, New Zealand. Um, I'm sure I'm leaving some out. I think that might be everyone. Um, and so I wanted to get a, a sort of a broad perspective and to look at both developed and developing countries and to kind of get a mix of European and non-European countries as well. So we thought that was important. And every time Jared came back from a new conference while I was doing this research, he would be like, there's a, new con there's a new national disability strategy here, you need to look at it. So the project sort of grew and grew out of all proportion and we had to kind of put a cap on it eventually. And as I said, the focus was on success factors. So what was it that made these national disability strategies work or parts of them work? But also, almost more importantly in some cases, on what were the barriers to implementation? Why could you have quite a good strategy on paper and what were the reasons for that not actually working in practice or for people with disabilities in their organisation saying we don't really feel that this strategy has led to much change for us. So how did I go about doing the research? We did the research over a, a two year period and because of the time frame and the number of countries involved I didn't get to visit all of the countries which I was a little bit sad about. Um, so the way in which we completed the research was to identify key contacts in each of the jurisdictions and we would look for people both who had a government perspective and also um, a civil society perspective. And sometimes it was interesting to, to see how, how much civil society engagement or how little civil society engagement with the issues there were and that was quite telling as well. So. I developed questionnaires for the different stakeholders and conducted <coughs> interviews with the contacts in each jurisdiction. And because, again, of the particular focus on Ireland, I did two rounds of interviews with the individuals in Ireland, which included government departments, disability organisations, but also some public bodies. So, for example, like the National Disability Authority. And I also talked to a number of other researchers working in this field to get their insight. And I interviewed them at the beginning of the project, uh, to sort of help me set the context and then also towards the end of the project where I was starting to come up with some findings to get their feedback on whether they thought those were useful for their work. <coughs> 
In addition, I had some focus groups with people with disabilities, also parents, carers, support people and advocates. And I, I tried to, as much as possible, talk to people in their local communities for that. And I also had a steering group throughout the project, <coughs> which included academics, some of whom are here, uh, from the fields of law, public policy, social policy, statistical analysis and strategic governance. So trying to get a really, really broad range of experience to bear on the project. I'm not going to spend long explaining Ireland's national disability strategy. There's a, there's a long history and I could talk about it all day, but again, because of the ex international experience in the room, I'm not going to spend too long on it. Just to say that Ireland's national disability strategy existed prior to Ireland's um, signature of the convention and it has, sort of has three key elements, legislation, policy and programmes. So on the legislative side we have the Disability Act, the Education for Persons with Special Educational Needs Act and the Citizens Information Act. Now you might be wondering what the Citizens Information Act is doing in there. Well that act partly was to establish a personal advocacy service for persons with disabilities uh, which hasn't been fully established as envisaged in the Act, which I can give you more information about later. On the policy side, there were six sectoral plans. So each of these, the following government departments, were asked to write up a plan under the Disability Act, explaining how they would realise the legislation within the remit of their department. And it's quite interesting to me when I started doing this research to look at what those departments were and which ones, more importantly, perhaps weren't included. So the departments that drew up these plans were transport, communications and local government, social and family affairs, employment and health. So can anyone think of any glaring gaps there? Can you repeat? <coughs> sure. There's transport, communications, local government, social and family affairs, employment and health. Education, Education is missing, yeah. Department of Justice. Justice, yeah. Housing. housing. Housing actually went, I think, under communications and local government, even though it's not said there. But yes, it, it doesn't, the word isn't there, but actually that department, I think, was covered. So, sport, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, one of the questions I asked at the outset of this project was, well, why, why those areas? You know, why not every area? Isn't every aspect of policy and every department have some relevance to the lives of people with disabilities? <clears throat> Agriculture isn't there. Uh, foreign affairs, which would have responsibility for the disability convention, is not was not asked to write a sectoral plan about the national disability strategy. And so there's, you can start to see here that there's a bit of a disjunct perhaps between the national and the international, and that's something I'll come back to when I look at what I learned from the other countries in the project. In terms of the programmes that were introduced in the, as part of our national disability strategy, uh, the key one, I guess, was the, was the money. So this was the multi-annual investment programme for disability services, and it ran for three years from 2006 to 2009. There was quite a lot of money put in to this program, which on the one hand was a positive, and I'll come back to the issue of how to fund and cost national disability strategies and how important that is. However, the one thing I would say is that mostly the money that went in went into traditional services um, that already existed. So we didn't think about how to more creatively spend our money to align with the principles and the ideas in the national disability strategy. We just allocated the money to services that people were already receiving. Um, and I'll explain later why I think perhaps that wasn't the best decision. So then the other things that exist that are relevant to the national disability strategy are, for example, a vision for change, which is the title of our national mental health policy. And again, you might ask why, why would there be a disconnect between mental health policy and, and disability policy and I'm sure this is an experience that other countries have as well. And also there was uh, our social partnership plan which was towards 2016 and as part of that persons with disabilities were, were specifically mentioned and then later um, a document was developed called the vision and mission of the national disability strategy which was very much sort of linked to realizing our social partnership plan towards 2016 and i should say now actually in very recent weeks uh, the implementation plan for the national disability strategy has been finalized i'm not sure if it's in the public domain yet but keep your eyes peeled on the department of justice homepage and we'll see if it goes <coughs> out there um, and i 
I don't want to claim that this was done as a result of the research project, but I think some of the um, discussions that I had, especially with civil society organisations about the lack of movement on the strategy, hopefully um, galvanised people to uh, argue for a more concrete implementation plan. And certainly I think Kathleen Lynch's Minister for Disability made that a priority. We'll see what the implementation plan looks like then, of course, that's, that's another question. Finally then, I would just say that in terms of monitoring the disability strategy in Ireland, there is a number of complex processes, but the one, the, the overall structure is something called the National Disability Strategy Stakeholders Monitoring Group, and that includes both representatives, government officials from the various departments, not just the six departments that are named there, but broader, so it includes education and justice as well, for example, and it also includes representatives of disability organisations and the number of disability organisations has expanded over time. So to go back to the broader comparative experience, uh, what was I looking for in these critical success factors? Well I wanted to know what was the turning point in a particular country's implementation of a national strategy. Sometimes it was the fact that a particularly committed minister or a minister with personal experience of disability was appointed. Um, sometimes it was the fact that the country had ratified or signed the UN Convention. Um, sometimes it was much more mon mundane things than that. I also wanted to know what were the main criticisms from civil society organisations about the strategy. And if there wasn't any criticism, that was quite telling also. And I tended not to believe that the fact that there was no criticism meant that the strategy was perfect but rather that perhaps there wasn't a very strong civil society tradition in that country, or at least not in disability. And then if the national disability strategy in a particular country had been changed over time, I wanted to know what were the motivations for either developing it in the first place or reframing it. So I'll get right down to business with the eight critical success factors that I came up with um, from this examination. And the first one I want to talk about is leadership. So when I say leadership in this context, I'm not just talking about leadership from government, but also leadership from individuals and communities and from civil society. And I think, especially from what we learned yesterday and what we've been talking about all week, um, in terms of the drafting of the UN Convention and the strong involvement of disabled people's organisations in that, I think people did learn really good leadership skills in that. Um, and some people were able to bring those back to their national experience, but somehow, in some context, the international experience got lost and, and didn't get reflected back into the sort of national system. And also I would say that in, in terms of the government side, often there is a lack of leadership. Um, disability is often not a political priority, and th that's certainly a shame. But where there is leadership, you know, really important things can happen as a result of that. When I looked at leadership, uh, I was interested in this idea of a culture of a learning organisation and some of the government officials I talked to were interested in this, which is the most important thing is not to pretend that everything is fine and not acknowledge any mistakes. The most important thing is to be transparent, acknowledge the mistakes and learn from those in the process. And that's what really makes a good leader, not just pressing ahead, pretending everything is fine. But it's also important to give government representatives the space to feel that they can acknowledge where mistakes have been made. And that's not something that always happens in a political culture. Also, in terms of leadership, I felt that it was very important for there to be a public forum in which disability issues would be debated. And potentially, even though often issues among the disability community are very divisive, that if there is a public forum, there is some chance of developing a coherent voice, of building coalitions and agreeing priorities on what are issues of national importance. And then the final thing I would say in terms of leadership is that it's really important that there are opportunities in a national disability strategy to further the leadership skills of people with disabilities. So it's not just about getting people to the table, it's about equipping people with the skills to make sure that they can meaningfully participate. Otherwise, it's just tokenism. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of the examples that I have. I'll try and just do one example, but please, if you want more information about how I felt about the other countries, come back to me and the questions, and we'll discuss it. Or if you, indeed, if you have a good example from your own country. So in terms of leadership, I would just like to highlight here um, the government of British Columbia, 
they have their, uh, in that province, they have their own disability strategy for British Columbia. And one of the things that they said was very important for them was that government wasn't um, policy makers, they were policy takers. So it was up to community to develop good ideas and government would take them on and run with them. And that's how they ran their national disability strategy, or not their national disability strategy, but their provincial disability strategy in British Columbia. Um, they also did a lot of work for the civil servants who worked on the disability strategy in terms of um, promoting this idea of their strategy as a learning process and also in trying to develop empathy and understanding between the officials about the lived experience of people with disabilities. So sending people to live in, dis in the disability community and to really spend time there and listen to people and the ideas that they had and the experiences that they had. Um, and encouraging that the sort of the sustainability of that knowledge because as we all know within government departments people can be working on disability one month and move to a completely different area the next month and if that knowledge isn't kept um, then a lot of the leadership potential can be lost. So the next critical success factor I looked at was participation and initially I started off by calling this consultation and then I realised that that was a mistake because we talk a lot about consulting people and sometimes that can be viewed as a tick box exercise and there's a big difference between consulting people and ignoring what they say and having a really participative process. And again, I think the experience of drafting the convention is really an example of a participative process that we would all like to see replicated in our domestic contexts. So it's not just about consulting disabled people's organisations before you write a strategy. It's about ensuring their sustained participation and involvement from the very beginning of the strategy, right through to the implementation and monitoring. And I would also say as part of that, and it's a broader issue, and one that we've heard about earlier in the week, particularly with the example of Japan, is about the political participation of people with disabilities is important. Because again, people with disabilities sometimes aren't seen as um, a major political force. They're not seen as a contingent of electors that we really need to be careful about losing. You know, if we don't do the things that people with disabilities want us to do, we won't be in our jobs in four years. I mean, this is not generally, and I am generalising here, something that um, politicians are particularly worried about. So it's not just about voting, of course, as well. In terms of facilitating the participation and strengthening the leadership skills of people with disabilities, we should be looking and asking questions about why people with disabilities aren't running for office. Are there barriers there? Um, are there barriers to people standing um, for political election? And if so, what can we do about those? I would also say in terms of participation that um, there's a lot of literature and community development about participatory evaluation. And there's a lot we can learn from that in the disability context as well. So when strategies are being monitored and evaluated, evaluated, we really need to think about, okay, well, how is that being done? Is it being done in a really grassroots way, in a way that people feel that they have input into the process? And if it is, that, again, is important for the long-term sustainability of that strategy. And as I said, in terms of leadership, there needs to be a skills transfer to ensure that people with disabilities can meaningfully participate in all the processes concerning a national disability strategy. So perhaps I'll mention the example of, of Bolivia here um, because I was really interested in this and one of the activists that I spoke to was really passionate about the idea that from the very beginning of the development of their strategy it was a grassroots initiative, it was a community initiative and there was a, a national structure of, called Codepedis of all of these different um, disability organisations but that this really had a local basis and so that there were activists in, in who went to very remote um, communities in order to share ideas about what a disability strategy could look like and gathered all of that, um, all of the insights of individuals and brought them back and really campaigned very hard to make sure that this was the basis of the national disability strategy in Bolivia. And I think as well, um, it's, it's important to have a culture whereby the political community is willing to take those ideas from grassroots activists and not just say, well, of course, you have your ideas, but we will develop our strategy separately and we'll, we'll ask you about it afterwards. So this was a really grassroots, bottom-up type approach to um, developing a strategy.
And perhaps I'll just mention as well the New Zealand uh, Disabled Persons Assembly, because again, this was a really good example that I liked of uh, how people with disabilities could sort of take back political power. So this is a, a, almost like a parliamentary um, assembly for disabled people. And it was open to non-disabled people to sort of join, but they weren't given voting powers. So family members could join and other people could observe the proceedings, but the only people who had voting powers were persons with disabilities. And I think that that was quite important in terms of the power balance. And again, is it an NGO? Is it an NGO? Technically, yes. I mean, it's, 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 it has its, own, um, has its own status as an organisation, but it, I, I would call it more a disabled persons organisation than an NGO, because the power and the leadership is from the persons with disabilities. And again, in terms of their involvement in the New Zealand disability strategy, they would write, for example, the introduction to the annual reports on the New Zealand strategy saying, okay, well, what's contained in this report is the progress. However, we also have identified as the Disabled Persons Assembly that these are some of the issues um, for us and these need to be taken into account. So it's, it's a willingness on both sides and the willingness of government to accept um, and, and to actually involve them in that process rather than saying, oh, well, you can write your own shadow report, but we're not going to include your thoughts in, in our own report. So I thought that was quite good. The next factor is the need to integrate the national with the international. And I've sort of referred to this as well in terms of some of the experience of CRPD drafting being lost when it comes back to national level. So it's a tricky one because in many countries, national disability strategies were developed long before the existence of any international convention. And perhaps they were developed in a certain way that needs to be completely rethought now that we have an international convention. And in many cases, in, in, including Ireland, for example, there are completely different structures for the implementation and monitoring of the national disability strategy to what is required, for example, in Article 33 to monitor and implement the UN Convention. And we really need to think about why are, they, why are there different structures there? Is it valid? Should we maintain them? Or should we think about integrating them so that those considering whether the national disability strategy is working or not, are also considering how to make the UN Convention a reality in that country. So I would say that as we know from yesterday's discussion of Article 33, there should be focal points, coordinating mechanisms and monitoring frameworks, which would include an independent mechanism. And you learned about that yesterday, so I'm not going to go into that detail. Um, but, it, but just to say, Think about your own dis country's disability strategy. Does it have all of those? Can we really say that there's an independent mechanism that is involved in the monitoring of those? Or is it primarily, as is the case with Ireland, being monitored by a combination of government officials and civil society, but without, for example, the involvement of a national human rights institution? And just to say also that in terms of when we move forward with national disability strategies, now that we have a convention, to think about how to align the principles and structures in the convention with our domestic law policy and process. So I would say in the context of Ireland, for example, the national disability strategy was possibly more concerned with socioeconomic rights um, than with some of the civil and political rights. It was sort of assumed that anti-discrimination law had already addressed those issues. But as we know from all of our discussions this week about, for example, Article 12 on legal capacity, this is an area that wasn't covered by our national disability strategy and also isn't covered by discrimination law. So we need to think about rethinking the, the breadth and scope of our national disability strategies now that we have the convention. So perhaps I'll, I'll briefly mention the Australian disability strategy here, but I'll allow Leanne, who's presenting next, to say much more about it. When I finish this, the, the final text of the strategy still hadn't been published. So, but I have, I have read it now that it is published. Um, and what I was interested in was the fact that the, it seemed to me at least, and Leanne can correct me, um, that the ratification of the convention was sort of the impetus for creating a national disability strategy, which was a challenge in Australia because of the federal nature um, of the country. So I, I was quite taken by that and also because I thought you were starting afresh, there was a good opportunity to make sure that the national and the international were joined up and that there wasn't a disconnect there. But of course, as I say, in countries where a national disability strategy already existed, it's a little bit more challenging to make sure that that joined up thinking is in place. So the next factor I looked at was positive legal obligations and funding. Now perhaps you know, these are two separate factors, but I'm putting them together here because they're, they're both very important. 
Um, when I talk about positive legal obligations, we tend to think often of national disability strategies as purely a policy instrument, a soft law measure that doesn't contain any legally binding obligations. But the strategies that I was most impressed with did include some kind of duty on, for example, public authorities to be proactive in promoting equality. So either there were positive action measures, or more commonly, there were duties to include people with disabilities in public decision making. So as I'll, I'll explain in the examples, one of those is the what was originally called the disability equality duty in the UK, but is now a general equality duty which goes across all grounds. And there have been some discussions about whether the extension of it from uh, quite a specific thing on, on disability, and there may have been a, a separate one on gender, um, to a broader equality duty was positive or negative in terms of how seriously local authorities, for example, took their obligations to think about people with disabilities um, when, they were, when they were doing their um, policy and when they were organising their services. So in terms of funding, um, it's really important, I think, for in order for a national disability strategy not to just remain something on paper, um, a sort of a dry policy instrument, for it to be accompanied with a, a funding plan, and in order for that to happen, there needs to be costing of the specific objectives and aims of that national disability strategy. But that's not to say that you need to have a lot of money in order to make a national disability strategy effective. I think we can think creatively about what should be funded and how, and that's why I talked at the beginning about the fact that in Ireland's national disability strategy originally, the fact that we just put money into the same existing services without thinking about how that money could be spent in a way that perhaps was, um, was more in keeping with what people with disabilities wanted, uh, I think that was possibly a missed opportunity. And now that we no longer have those types of funding to, um, to accompany a national disability strategy, um, perhaps we're forced to think creatively, but also um, it, it is a shame because we, we can look at the objectives in the national disability strategy now, and uh, while we should be able to allocate certain amounts of funding, it would be much more a case of, as happens in many disability strategies, saying that this, this objective needs to be met, however it must be done out of existing departmental budgets, which doesn't really mean anything. Unless you have ring-fenced funding for each of the specific objectives, in my experience, those objectives tend not to be realised. And finally, on the funding side, I would just say that, um, as I've mentioned, it's not necessarily about spending more money, but spending the money that you have wiser. And so cost-effective measures can be more in keeping with the, as we've heard all week about the things that people with disabilities want in order to facilitate independent living can be far more cost effective than continuing to warehouse and institutionalise people with disabilities. So we need to think creatively about that but also not be discouraged by the fact that relatively little funding might be available. So I'll, as I mentioned the disability equality duty in, um, in the UK, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, as I've said, it's a, it's a legal obligation on public authorities to consider people with disabilities when they uh, take actions. And this would include when they decide what services to provide. And it's actually been quite useful in terms of uh, a number of, of cases on strategic litigation that have been used to say that where services were cut or where funding was cut, um, the local authority did not adequately consider the impact of that on persons with disabilities and those decisions have been, um, well, at least temporarily in some cases, reversed. So I think that having that kind of a legal obligation there ensures that more sort of disability proofing happens, not only in legislation but also in sort of political and, and policy decisions and decisions about funding. So the next critical success factor I want to talk about is transparency and accountability. And I've mentioned this to a certain extent in the context of leadership, but I wanted to make it its own specific success factor also. So I think, again, there needs to be transparency and accountability on both the government side and the civil society side. In terms of government, I think there needs to be transparency in reporting and progress made and barriers encountered. So one of the things that I experienced when I started to do this research was difficulty in finding out, um, even just accessing the progress reports for Ireland's national disability strategy from the various departments. Now I knew the reports were being written because I knew there were biannual meetings where all the stakeholders got together and the government departments presented what they had done in the last six months and civil society organisations asked them questions about it. 
but I couldn't access those meetings as a researcher and I couldn't, in many cases, the departments did not publish their progress reports on their websites. Now, even though these progress reports are, you know, they're, they're their department's own progress reports, so they're not going to be saying things they haven't done, they're going to be talking up the progress that they've made. So I found that sort of interesting and um, a little bit challenging. And since then, I think that departments have changed their ways in some respects and more information about progress is available online. But just the fact that these meetings are closed as well, I think is interesting. Um, and so, you know, the broader public doesn't have access to any of this information about what's happening with the National Disability Strategy. And many people with disabilities on the ground, when I uh, talked to people in focus groups, had no idea about what it was or whether it was relevant to them or what was happening with it. So on the one hand, of course, I think people with disabilities are entitled to information about how the strategy is progressing, as is the public at large. But I also think that if it is more transparent and if people acknowledge more openly some of the barriers that they're encountering, people might be more willing to accept, um, to accept that genuine efforts are being made. So if I think government departments can be open about, well, yes, we intended to achieve that objective, but we couldn't because we didn't, we allocated the funding to a different thing, or because this barrier was encountered, then at least if we've acknowledged it, we can start to address it. And I think people with disabilities are quite reasonable in terms of what they're requesting. So I don't think that anyone would be um, adversely affected by having this information out in the open. Of course, this isn't just about transparency for government. It's also about transparency in appointing representatives of the from the disability community. So when I wanted to find out what were the organisations that were represented on this National Disability Strategy Stakeholders Monitoring Group and how was it these organisations that were chosen as opposed to other organisations, some of that information was quite murky. And it seemed to have been sort of historical decisions or the fact that people had been involved for a long time rather than any sort of open call for who would like to be represented on this or any sort of open selection process. And finally, I would say accountability from both public and private bodies who are charged with delivering the strategy is key. Because, because a lot of the aspects of the Irish National Disability Strategy, for example, relate to the provision of services to persons with disabilities. And often those are done through um, voluntary organisations, but ones that are in receipt of public money. And we've had a lot of discussions in this country about um, the accountability of those organisations, especially for the public money that they've received. So I think that that's very important as well. I'd like to give a, a Swedish example of good practice here, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing the word wrong, so if there's anyone in the audience who can correct me, please do. Um, there's an e-tool for accessibility, which I believe is e -vertigant. perhaps I'm wrong. Um, it's a, a tool, an online tool that is used to monitor local authority accessibility. And most of the people charged with inputting information into the tool are local authority representatives from the municipalities. However, the information is then completely publicly available and there's also, as far as I understand, a process where individual people with disabilities or members of the public can provide information about how accurate the um, information on the tool is in terms of whether places um, in the public in that municipality really are accessible. Um, there's also a, a closed forum, I think, on the site for representatives from the different municipalities to talk to each other and discuss problems that they're encountering or um, kind of share information and solutions. So I really liked this and the fact that it's all open in the public I think is, is a good example of how information can be made available to people. But it's also of course important to ensure that the information that's there is accurate and is capable of being adjusted by individuals with disabilities in that municipality who know better than anyone else whether it really is accessible. So the next issue I want to talk about is mainstreaming disability equality and I think sometimes the term mainstreaming has a bad reputation because it's used a lot but it's maybe not clear what it means or it's been used to, um, to justify sort of getting rid of specific supports that people with disabilities might want. So in this context I want to be clear about how I'm using it which comes back to the point that I made initially about why were certain departments excluded from the requirement to prepare sectoral plans in Ireland. Disability equality is an issue for everyone, it should be an issue for every government department. So and we had a lot of conversations with the academic steering group that I used for the project about 
whether you know the ultimate ideal was not to have a national disability strategy at all. If, if you might need one in, in the beginning just to raise awareness of the issues, but ideally, wouldn't it be much better to have a national transport strategy that includes people with disabilities and national education strategy that includes inclusive education and people with disabilities? So these are some of the ideas about the, the utopia, perhaps, but it's important to think about them and how do we get there. So we could start by disability proofing legislation in the way that we perhaps gender proof legislation. And this is something that has been on the cards in Ireland, for example, for a very long time, but took a long time for specific guidance on how to do disability proofing to make its way into the Cabinet Handbook. What I like about this obligation is that it places the focus back on systems design. So it's very much in keeping with our the social model idea of disability, that it's not an individual problem, but it's actually systems themselves that are inaccessible and systems that discriminate against individuals. So, like I said, thinking about having the general strategies that exist for all of these policy areas, like education, like transport, and so on, made accessible, made inclusive of persons with disabilities, rather than saying that those things should be covered in a separate special national disability strategy, because then perhaps that doesn't have the same profile or importance. I also looked at this idea of universal design principles for disability policy, which is not my idea, I hasten to add. This is something that's been written about by many other people. So again, as I said, moving from a separate disability strategy to more general public policy strategies that were inclusive and accessible. So universal design we talk about more in the context of, of building accessibility or, or you know, the accessibility of services, but I think it's something we can also apply as a concept to policy. And then, because those obligations are more on the government side, I wanted to think about, well, what would dis mainstreaming disability equality look like on the civil society side? And I think one of the things it might look like is disability groups forming alliances with broader civil society to seek reform in the interests of all. So often, civil society can be very fragmented, and of course the disability community is not a homogenous group in the first place. But it's in government's interest to divide and conquer also. So, you know, to separate out different groups that might be experiencing discrimination and to have different approaches or to pit groups against each other competing for scarce resources. And I think it's really important to try and avoid um, getting sucked into that and for groups to come together and, and form alliances and coalition build around issues that are, that are sort of in the interests of all. And the example of that I might give is in South Africa the inclusion of children with disabilities in the Children's Act involved alliance building between children's organization, mainstream children's organisations and the disability community. So to include children with disabilities in a way that was sensitive to the requirements and to the um, concerns of the disability community. And I think that, that was, that's quite, a, quite an interesting process and one that perhaps many other countries might learn from in terms of law reform or um, coalition building. I'm nearly there, there's only two more. <laughs> so the next critical success factor is independent monitoring. We've heard a lot about this yesterday, so I'm not going to spend too long on it. But the one thing I would say is that national disability strategies that rely primarily on self-reporting by government as the only way of tracking progress, um, there, there are flaws in that. And I would suggest that, as we know from the convention, we need to have more independent monitoring. And you can do that in a number of ways. You can monitor, have an independent monitor for the strategy as a whole, or within some countries that I examined, they took an independent monitor for a specific aspect of the strategy. So there might be specific, for example, disability acts or laws that were considered components of the strategy. And when it came time to review those, it was that was done by an independent monitor. So there's a number of different ways in which it can be done. But I think we shouldn't just rely on disabled people's organisations to be the only monitors of the strategy and I think it's important to involve whatever infrastructure exists within a country for independent monitoring, whether that's of human rights generally or of equality generally, then I think it's important to consider how they can be involved. I'll skip the Article 33.2 part because there was a lot of discussion about that um, <coughs> yesterday, um, only to say, to reaffirm the point about integrating national and international one more time. Um, and to say that if that's something we've acknowledged is important for the UN Convention, it, we should also acknowledge its importance for national disability strategy. And again, I've, I've made this point, so I'm not going to labour it, but the idea that it, there shouldn't be a disconnect also means that 
monitoring the national disability strategy should lead to monitoring the CRPD. It shouldn't be two separate, isolated processes that don't connect or interact with each other. Um, perhaps I'll use the, the New Zealand example there of the Office for Disability Issues. Um, I guess what I thought was kind of interesting about this was the independent review of the strategy that happened midway through the first period of the strategy and also at the end. Um, and this was done, this was a sort of a contract that was for a public tender and, and was done by an outside agency. So it wasn't just an internal review within the, the Government Office for Disability Issues. One of the interesting findings from that, in fact, was that while government officials seemed to feel that progress in the disability strategy was quite positive, civil society and people on the ground really didn't see any difference in their daily lives. And one of the solutions that was proposed to that was to focus, because this strategy was uh, so broad, sort of similar to the convention, that it was important to prioritise a number of key areas that people with disabilities felt would make a difference to them and to put concerted effort in the national disability strategy to address those in the next period, so in, in the next five-year term. And, you, you know, you, there's positives and negatives to that approach. You might say, yeah, but all the rights in the strategy were important, so if you highlight specific ones, then perhaps other people will lose out. But at the same time, if you want to see real progress on the ground, the reality is you, you may have to prioritise and say what are the most important areas or the ones in which we feel the most progress can be achieved that mean something to people with disabilities lives and they might be quite small or mundane things in the broader context but it's important to have that conversation at least and make a decision about whether we want to prioritise certain things and if so what and to take seriously the views of persons with disabilities about what the priorities should be. And of course, there might not be unanimous consensus on what those priorities should be, but it's important to have that conversation in the open. I think this is my final one, and it leads nicely into what Jerome is going to, and Martha are going to talk about later. So again, I won't spend too much time on data and indicators because you'll hear more about it from them. But again, in order to make sure that national disability strategies are not just some policy that's left on a shelf, it's important to set out... Can you repeat the point? Okay, so I'm, I'm just talking now about the critical success factor of data and indicators and the point I'd like to make is that these are crucial to ensure that national disability strategies do not become policy instruments that are left on the shelf. We need to align the objectives of each um, area of a national disability strategy with specific outcomes that can be measurable and collect information that's important um, and granular to a level of detail that I'm sure Jerome will discuss later that actually demonstrates that progress is being made. So how do you do this? And there's a lot of discussion about it and you'll hear more detail later, but I would, I mean, broadly speaking, there should of course be a combination of quantitative measures and qualitative information that will measure the lived experience of people with disabilities. And there is work going on in many countries to do this and at European level, which you'll hear more about from Martha, um, in terms of how indicators of, of monitoring both the convention and monitoring, for example, the EU disability strategy can be developed. And of course, this is in itself a requirement of the UN Convention. Article 31 requires states to gather information and to use this information to inform policy and domestic implementation of the convention. So finally, I have a good practice example from Ireland. Cited, which is our National Disability Survey. And this uh, is, I think, quite, quite a positive development. The only thing that I'm slightly concerned about is it was really good information that was gathered as a result of the census and sort of a breakout study from that that was done. However, it's not going to be useful to us unless the study is rerun so that we can actually tell whether anything has improved or not. So that would be my, my one concern about highlighting it as an example of good practice. It's, it's by no means certain that, the, that there is any funding to ever rerun this study. What I really liked about this um, is that it comes in two volumes, and the first volume is just about prevalence, which you know is a certain amount of information that's useful, but the second volume is more interesting to me because they break it down into the different areas of participation in individuals' lives, and they ask really good questions. So they don't just look at what is the employment rate of people with disabilities in the open labour market, they say, if you're not employed in the open labour market, is it because of any of the following reasons? Is it because you didn't complete your education? 
and then they go into, and why didn't you complete your education? Where was it that the school wasn't accessible to you? Did you not have the correct support? Is it because there's no accessible transport that could bring you to employment? Um, is it because you fear losing your disability benefits? Is it because you fear being uh, victimised at work or harassed? So there's really a lot of very good detailed information that gives us the, some, some more answers to why the exclusion of people with disabilities happens. And that's something I think could be very useful in terms of how we monitor both the Convention and the National Disability Strategy. But as I said, the survey really, really needs to be repeated in order for us to measure progress, and I'm not sure that it will be. So to wrap up, um, in terms of our outputs from the research, we had a big international conference where I brought many, of, many speakers from the individual countries that were part of the project to present on various aspects of their disability strategies. And all the video from that conference is available on our website as well as the PowerPoints of the individual speakers. And of course there's the book, as Emily mentioned, um, and we have copies in the centre if anyone would like to have a look at that. We also intend to sort of keep a, a watching brief over this area in the Centre for Disability Law and Policy, and particularly of course because we are based in Ireland with reference to <coughs> the ongoing implementation and monitoring of Ireland's national disability strategy. And when I finished it, I really hoped that, apart from disseminating the findings, that we would be able to have for me, this research was the first step in a conversation about how to move our national disability strategy forward. And I think that there is some movement. Um, as I said, an implementation plan has now been finalised for the national disability strategy, although I haven't seen it yet, so I'm not sure what it looks like or how good it is, and I don't want to say that it's amazing before I've seen it. But again, at least it sort of reinvigorated a conversation, and I know that since I finished the research, more um, and broader disability organisations have been brought into the process in terms of the monitoring group. So Mad Pride, for example, which would be a sort of mental health organisation, has been more involved, uh, as well as SHASIV, which is an organisation of self-advocates with intellectual disabilities. So rather than just going to the, the umbrella organisations, there has been more involvement of specific groups, and I think that that's been important. And I'll just leave it there. And I'll, I have some time for questions. Uh, yeah, OK, thank you very much, Eleanor. There's a, a wonderfully rich presentation, and I'm sure um, lots of questions could come from that. Um, given that we're up against time, I'll just take uh, two questions before we move on to the, uh, the next speaker. Anybody? Yes, gentlemen. Oh, a wonderful presentation. This is very useful for me because I am one of the members of the board in my state, uh, uh, responsible for drafting a state a strategy. Uh, the point which I want to uh, make is uh, it's a very useful toolkit, but I think uh, two elements uh, may be added uh, in this state uh, uh, to to make it more effective across the world. And I think those two elements are uh, capacity building of the state. Because uh, what about the uh, all pervasive attitudinal deficit on part of state? How to train the uh, state officials? So capacity building of the state officials uh, that is very important. Uh, so maybe that uh, that may be one of the factors. And uh, the another uh, factor, although it, is, it comes, it overlaps, but still I would like to flag it. And that is elimination of physical and uh, attitude attitudinal barriers because uh, uh, that is another important uh, factor. Particularly this factor is critical in uh, uh, developing countries and like countries like India. Now another small comment on British Columbia model, uh, because I am myself uh, experiencing this. Uh, government claims that it is a taker. But let me tell you that when government sometimes claims that it is only a taker, perhaps government is giving up its responsibility. Mm. And uh, if anything goes wrong, it can easily blame the drafters. Uh, moreover, we also face a lot of problems in terms of infrastructure, in terms of facilities, uh, when we undertake the work of drafting the strategies. Moreover, we also face the problems from uh, uh, DPOs, because it is not possible within our limited resources to bring all the DPOs on board when we draft the strategy. Therefore, I think if you are talking about mainstreaming, then it, it is probably a good idea that there may be a coordination, but the bulk of the responsibility to draft the 
uh, policy must be taken by the state. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, comment. Uh, any quick question before we move on? No? Okay. Thank you. I, I just want to comment myself on, on some of what you said because you speak to a lot of the issues that, that, that I deal with where you have a particular strategy but you don't have great enthusiasm for, um, for actually uh, um, meeting the, uh, the strategic objectives by, by government. And when you were talking about the Bolivia there, you said in relation to the grassroots initiative, you said it's important to have a culture whereby the political class are willing to accept um, grassroots in, initiatives, but I think, you know, if you could just finish the sentence after, it's important to have a culture whereby the political class are willing to whatever, uh, that's it. And when you, when you sort of mused about why, you know, the, the strategy, strategies aren't implemented in many cases, even though they're beautiful, they've been worked out in consultation with people, I, I'm reminded of the great phrase that, that culture eats strategy for, for breakfast, and I think what, what you're really talking about is being able to, to align uh, the strategy with, with, with the culture. Zellner, thank you very much indeed for that, and we can get more. I think more. there was just one more question up here. Sorry, if forgive you, me. Yeah. If we have time. Um, my, my needs, um, like taking this experience, um, to also to globalize it. Uh, as you mentioned, in terms of making disability responsibility for every sector, uh, but also anticipating uh, or what we call maybe monitoring without indicators, because nothing prevents, um, even if it's not there, uh, for us, in, uh, for instance, in Africa, nothing uh, prevents us engaging in uh, poverty reduction strategy papers to make sure that the disability issues are addressed. Nothing prevents us, for instance, engaging um, on uh, monitoring also MDGs so that uh, even if there is no specific target, but because disability is uh, uh, cross-cutting issues that this, this, uh, at least the reporting some of the issues are uh, brought uh, um, um, uh, into the, the, the light so that we can advance because because of this marginalization we can run a risk for instance now when we are designing new millennium development goals that we are left also outside discussion. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Do you want to comment on this? Yeah, if I just respond quickly to both Sanjay and Gabrielle's points. Um, yeah, just to say, on, uh, th these are really important contributions and thank you for them. Um, I would agree completely with capacity building of the state and I think um, perhaps I didn't draw that out enough from the leadership um, criteria that I mentioned, but I certainly consider it to be part of that. And, and, and again, I wouldn't like to underestimate the physical and attitudinal barriers that people experience. I think the issue about um, government being a policy taker or a policy maker is interesting um, because you know it, it might very much depend on the issue at hand and I think we do need to be conscious of the need to uh, avoid delegation of responsibility but also to actively include individuals who have good ideas and not just dismiss them because they're not within government. And Gabrielle, very, thank you for that, I think that, that's very important. Um, and, and really links in with the idea of mainstreaming disability equality so that it really becomes an issue for um, not just to look at a national policies that are general, like transport and education, but to look at the international issues as well, like the Millennium Development Goals. So thanks for that. Okay, thank you very much and thank you for your questions. Now, our next speaker, we've already been given a sneak preview of some of the work that she's doing, Professor Leanne Basser, who's Associate Professor of Law at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia, and adjunct faculty in the graduate program in critical disability studies at York University in Canada and her work is absolutely steeped in the issues of uh, disability and human rights and she's going to talk to us today about the evolution of the Australian National Disability Strategy. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I think I need help again. So thank you. Uh, just, just to, um, before the PowerPoint comes comes on to say by word of introduction, um, in relation to the Australian Disability, National Disability Strategy, I have my kind of private individual hat and I have my academic hat, but I was also a member of the Victorian Disability Advisory Council um, so that I had um, 
not a personal role in uh, beyond my personal role in um, contributing submissions for the development of the strategy. Each state um, and territory in, in Australia has a, a disability advisory council. They're made up in different ways, but each of those councils had a role a, a role um, in feeding into the national disability strategy. Okay. So, um, I wanted to start with a little bit of background, like two, two seconds worth of background. You've heard reference um, from Rosemary, from Eleanor just before, to our um, federal structure. And um, you can see from the PowerPoint, the federal government has responsibility for things like foreign affairs, the collection of taxation, um, and a number of other issues, but disability policy has traditionally been a matter for the states. There was a, um, prior to the National Disability Strategy being developed for about 20 odd years, or perhaps nearly 30 years, we had a Commonwealth State Disability Agreement, which was largely a funding mechanism from the mid 80s that allowed the federal government to set policy in some areas and to provide funding. The federal government itself was only responsible for disability employment services, although the legislation would have allowed it to, to do more than that. So it's a big shift to move from what were eight individual disability strategies, and in some cases no disability strategy, to a national um, disability strategy. And um, my focus in my presentation to you is, is quite narrow. It's on the National Disability Strategy and on the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which is part of the implementation of that strategy. Um, I haven't really mentioned in the slides the disability discrimination legislation, which is an important part of the strategy and predates any discussions of the convention because it was enacted 10 years before we started talking about a convention. And I, I thought I should just flag that within the DDA, we have um, provision for tr uh, disability disc discrimination standards, and they've been quite important in the areas of education, transport, um, and now access to premises, amongst other things. There's also in relation to um, to things like telecommunications. Um, so there were some kind of big picture policy mechanisms in place before we started talking about a national disability strategy. And we've also had a, a separate mental health strategy, although the NDS applies to the broad range of disability, including mental health. Now, one of the other introductory words I wanted to say is that Sitting um, at home in Melbourne, it's felt like things have gone quite slowly. And, um, but in preparing for the presentation, I realise how fast, in the scheme of things, things have happened. Um, I wanted to flag the dates of Australia's involvement or, or with the CRPD in signing and ratifying it, because it shows you how quickly we moved um, once we start, after we'd signed the convention. So we had a change of government in November 2007 after we'd signed the convention. And this was really important to the ratification process, I believe. The Liberal government would have ratified, I'm sure, but everything went much faster um, with the change of government. Disability was a major platform, policy platform, for the Labor Party prior to obtaining government. And within the Labor Party, disability issues had a champion. They had a champion in Bill Shorten, who entered Parliament in 2007 as the Parliamentary Secretary for Disability and Children's Services, but also um, in the Minister for Community Services, Jenny Macklin, and um, later, the current Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. 
So I think it is important to remember that there is that champion because that does make a huge difference um, in the development of disability policy. So within three months of taking office, the government had committed to a national disability strategy using the CRPD as a framework. But they then had the challenge of bringing all the states along with them because, as I've said, um, disability is largely, disability policy is largely a state matter. Um, before they'd actually achieved that, or as part of the carrot for achieving it, they announced, um, there was an announcement of a significant boost in disability funding. This also required some negotiations. Um, this was, this funding initially was to um, address unmet needs in relation to accommodation, in-home support um, and respite care. Uh, by July, everybody had agreed to a new reform agenda for disability policy and the national disability strategy was seen as a key way of implementing the principles um, in the CRPD and ensuring they came down into disability policy and disability programs. It's an interesting um, way of bringing everybody into the picture. The focus wasn't just on self-advocates, on people with disabilities. It was extended to families and carers. So that um, when the federal government at, at much the same time appointed a national disability advisory council, it was actually a national council um, for people with disabilities and their families. This, in, you know, there was some cause for concern about this, but in practice it's actually been a very positive development enabling cooperation rather than confrontation in the development of the strategy. Now the strategy had from the beginning an element of nothing about us without us. It took seriously, um, particularly in the beginning, <laughs> it took seriously the obligation on the state to work with people with disabilities in developing policy and programs. So we've got the National Care Estra and we've um, council established in September. Um, and in October, uh, the government released a discussion paper. This is part of that consultation process. So um, there was an opportunity for private consulta uh, private submissions, individuals and organisations to make written or um, verbal submissions um, using telecommunications or and also a public consultation process. There were four are held around the country, public meetings and also private meetings like with disability advisory councils. Uh, in a very short period of time, 750 submissions were received. Now the body that was tasked with combing through those submissions and um, making recommendations for what should be in the strategy was the, na the National People with Disabilities and Carer Council. And in 2009, they produced a report called Shut Out, the experience of people with disabilities and their families in Australia. And this really provided, we were talking about an evidence base or the lack of an evidence base much of the strategy come, comes out of the submissions um, that were received. So the report highlighted the social exclusion and discrimination people with disabilities um, felt they were experiencing, the lack of so services and support, the need for a lifetime care and support scheme, and I'll slightly digress for a moment. One of the things about the whole um, CRPD process as I see it, this is my personal um, view, was that what it did was it really mobilised grassroots disability organisations in Australia. Our government wasn't initially prepared to be involved, didn't think we needed a convention, were persuaded that we did by this mobilisation of DPOs. And that mobilisation is really important to the outcome after we've signed and ratified the convention. 
because when we signed that same coalition was lobbying for speedy ratification. And members of that coalition started lobbying for a sustainable way in which to provide supports, which will bring me eventually to the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Um, there were also issues about employment experience. We have quite a good system of um, income support for people with disabilities. The, the pension at the moment is better than that received pretty much on any other benefit. And we have quite a, a large employment program, but very poor employment of people with disabilities. So a lot of the submissions um, that are reported back on in the shutout um, report related to the inability to overcome the barriers to participation in the workforce. And I guess also to the experience of those people who did get into the workforce. Accessibility was another issue that was highlighted in the report, as was education and people's general social experience. So all the things that we've, we've heard about, about um, barriers to full inclusion. Um, so the strategy was developed and the negotiations went on to um, get everybody, all the governments, to sign up. It was a 10-year strategy from 2010 to 2020. It signed in February 2011 because it took time to get everybody to the table, all the governments to the table. Um, it uses a human rights framework. It explicitly incorporates CRPD principles. It incorporates a whole of government approach and it, it, it clearly states that people with disabilities, their families and carers must be part of the policy making proce process. The areas of coverage, as you can see, are very broad within the, within the um, policy. And when it's come down to implementation, some areas have been prioritised um, over others. But at the moment, we're just talking about the actual strategy. Um, there's a list of aims and purposes of the strategy. So it's, the idea is to have a high-level policy framework that provides a coherent disability policy across the country. When you, those of you who live in federations will know that you can have benefits in one state and then if you have to move um, for some reason to another state, you have to go through the whole application process again and the benefits that you can receive can be quite different. Well, we will now have, a, well we now have um, a coherent national framework and um, we shouldn't, people should be able to move um, around the country without experiencing that issue. Um, I'm just seeing if I need to comment on, I don't think I really need to comment on any of the other points in this um, PowerPoint, I'll just move on. So um, the strategy includes a number of approaches, they call them approaches to make it, um, in my view, a little bit less legally binding <laughs> at one level, but the, the approaches for developing strategy are to include people with disabilities um, and to mainstream services as much as possible to ensure that disability, the disability lens, like the gender lens, is integrated into policies when they're made and programs as they're developed. Um, the strategy is also targeted at community engagement, at breaking down the barriers um, to full participation and inclusion for people with disabilities. Um, again, thinking about universal design, taking account of the life course. Particularly important that I want to flag is that um, the policies are to be person-centred. So there is built into this the idea of choice and voice, if you like, that 
people with disabilities, the policies and programs and services that, that they receive or are subjected to should be responsive to their needs and wishes. Independent living um, and the whole of government approach are also built into the strategy. Um, strategy is a strategy and, and we heard already from Eleanor, and I'm, I'm going to have to speed up, I, I won't talk faster, I'll just try and cover things a little bit more quickly. Um, there are three implementation plans envisaged. The first one was released last year, laying the groundwork for the first four years. And the idea here is that um, there will be work done and then in the next implementation plan there will be a reflection and assessment of what's been done as well as the plan moving forward. Um, the as part of this whole process, as I already mentioned, the National Disability Agreement has been revised and additional funding has been committed to disability services, both at the state and the federal level. I've already talked about, well, I've talked about the councils which are really made up of um, people with disabilities, DPOs and other NGOs, but there have also been um, councils created of ministers and of officials in government across the federal and state level to in ensure that we move forward with the um, national disability strategy. There was $10 million dedicated to research in areas that were relevant to the agreement, just specifically for that, state and territory plans, and we've really I've looked, mentioned most of these things. Monitoring and evaluation is a whole long um, talk in itself, so I'll just for the moment skip over that because I want to move on to talk to you about the National Disability Insurance Scheme because this is a major, major innovation for us. Um, the government at the same time, much the same time as it's developing the National Disability Strategy, um, asked the Productivity Commission um, to conduct an inquiry into long-term care and support. And it wasn't really surprising uh, that the Productivity Commission came back recommending the establishment of a National Disability Insurance Scheme. A, a core element of this scheme is that it's to be, fun, to be funded by a levy, on tax, a taxation levy, um, similar to our Medicare scheme. And in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, or a month ago, the federal government passed legislation um, increasing the levy by half a percent and, um, what's the word? Putting a fence around the, the fund that's, Ring fence, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, that's raised. Um, so that that is specifically dedicated to the National Disability Insurance Scheme. They've also made various announcements, which I think I've mentioned um, in the PowerPoints, of other funding, initial funding um, for the scheme. But the idea was to make sure that it's a sustainable scheme, that if we change governments in September or whenever we have an election, um, this goes on. Um, and I have to say that disability has been a, bi a bipartisan issue. The levy would not have got through without the Liberal Party supporting it. Um, they did support it, although they would never have initiated um, such a levy. So we've got progressive rollout of this scheme, as you can see, with the full scheme coming in by July 2019. Um, now, the scheme is to provide services and supports for people with significant disabilities. And it establishes, an, the, the legislation was passed also in the last month, and it establishes an agency which is going to be called Disability Care. I've kind of got a little bit of a problem with the title, but I wasn't asked. Um, so the agency's role, primary role, is in assessment and funding. It doesn't provide services. It operates a little bit similarly. We have um, in Victoria a, a, an accident, a no-fault liability accident insurance scheme, and it, it operates a bit like that. There are strict eligibility criteria. You can only apply if you're under 65. Once you're 65, your disabilities just become old age. 
and you, you move out of the disability, I'm really quite worried about, you know, you move out of the disability service sector into the aged care sector. Anyway, you have to be, a person has to be a citizen or a permanent resident or a New Zealander with a particular kind of visa um, to be eligible. You have to also result, you, ha you have to be living in Australia and your ability to move out for periods of time is quite circumscribed. You, you can go away for six weeks out of the country, but if you go away for more than six weeks, then um, at least in theory, your eligibility is, um, can, can be withdrawn. Now, one of the th interesting things in the way it's the, la the language of the legislation is a person with a disability can apply to be assessed to be a participant in the scheme. So the, the legislation does incorporate principles consistent with the CRPD, but because it's about money, it's very careful not to talk about anybody having a right to anything. Um, the disability has to be a long-term disability, although it can be one which varies over time. So it, it takes into account the fact that um, for people with mental health issues or with people with some neurological disabilities, they affect their lives um, more or less at different points in time. And it has to um, affect functional capacity in, in the range of areas um, that are listed there, at least in one of those areas. So it's, there's, we, we have to go back, as we never seem to be able to avoid in Australia in disability services, we go back to looking at, well, it is, it's, it's about function, but it's also about medical diagnosis. Um, now, a key feature of the scheme is that when a person applies to become a participant in the scheme, if they're accepted into the scheme by the agency, they then have to draw up with the agency a participant plan. And the there are a series of principles which you can see in the PowerPoint in relation to plans. They have to be individualised, they have to be directed by the participant. Um, there, there are, is a, a section in the Act that talks about where relevant, they have to respect and consider the role of family, carers and significant others. Um, they, and also to consider informal networks and other available supports. Really the principles mean that in making the plan, you have to take account of what generic services are available, what's reasonable to expect families to do, because the support that's provided is what is reasonable and necessary. Um, so the starting point is that the participant um, maps out uh, goals and aspirations in relation to their life, what they need supports to achieve or to, if not to achieve, to participate in. And then the supports are assessed against those goals and aspirations. Um, but you can see that we know we're dealing with uh, limited resources so that the supports have to be value for money. Um, they have to be reasonable relative, to, this is a quote from the Act, reasonable relative to both the benefits achieved and the cost of alternative supports. Um, and they have to be assessed as beneficial and effective in the context of current good practice. The person doing this assessment is, well, in the words of the Act, it's the CEO of the agency, but it's the people working in disability care who make the assessment. Um, as I've already flagged, the, they can make an assessment of what's reasonable for family and others to provide and also what other services um, are available and taking account of obligations like the obligation under the DDA to make reasonable adjustments, um, say, in the workplace. Now, I should tell you, education is not included 
in the NDIS. Education is still funded separately. It's a big problem. But education is left out except for early intervention services. So parents of a child with disabilities, a young child who require early intervention services, can apply for the child to be a participant and funding can be obtained for early intervention. But for school age, which in our case is like 5 till 18, education is not included and, high, and higher education won't be included either. So um, that's a big, it would be a big chunk of funding if it was in, but it's a big omission. Um, in in, it's a big omission. Okay. There's also, I mean, the Act is unbelievably detailed. Unbelievably. And every area, there's the power to make rules as well. So in, in Section 34, you've got a whole lot of issues about reasonable support um, and necessary supports, but within the rules there can be more, um, well it's not guidance, they're rules um, about this. There are um, provisions in the legislation for a person with a disability to appoint a nominee, a plan nominee. Um, this is done through a formal uh, statement and, and agreement between the person and their nominee. Um, there are also, you can have a correspondence nominee. So there are, there are mechanisms which um, facilitate what we were talking about a couple of days ago, uh, supported decision making, but there are also mechanisms for substitute decision making um, as well. So a person with a disability has a say in how the funds are managed and they can ask in their plan to self-manage the funds, but just asking won't be enough. They're going to be assessed as to whether they can self-manage. Um, they can also ask if the funds be managed by a registered plan management provider or by someone specified by disability care. And a person can't manage their own funds if they're insolvent. Actually, that's not necessarily unfair, perhaps, but if they're insolvent. Or if the CEO of the agency is satisfied that to do so represents, I've got a typo, an unreasonable risk to the participant or another reason prescribed by the rules. Now, I think this, we'll have to see how it plays out. I think this could be quite a restriction um, on what's seen as individual funding program. Okay. So I am actually running out of time. I did, or have run out of time. Um, there are a whole lot of ways in which the development of both, or the, the, both the National Disability Strategy and the National Disability Insurance Scheme will be monitored by advisory councils that have been set up by government, um, or principally by advisory councils that have been set up by government. Um, those advisory groups as I mentioned, there's them before, but they are made up of a broad range of people, including people with disabilities, DP, representatives of DPOs, of service providers, and the union. And I'll stop there because okay. I have run out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leanne.